I had a serendipitous find yesterday. There is a Japanese secondhand store chain called Book Off. You may or may not have heard of it, but basically they're um, there are books, you know, video games, movies, manga, little anime figurine thingies, and uh, a lot of them are secondhand. I think they're mostly all secondhand. I don't know if they have any uh, anything for sale that's like new, but it's just kind of like a fun place to go. I was with my fiance at the time, and we were just walking around. Uh, you know, it's one of our spots where we like to go and hang out and just look through all the different used books. It's not all Japanese stuff. Some there's a lot of just regular, you know, books about various different topics. But one thing I always do is I go to the manga section and I go to H and I see I look if there's any Hikaru no Go editions out um, because. I don't know. I have the first four volumes of the manga, and if I happened upon the fifth one, maybe I would pick it up and just add it to my collection. Uh, no Hikaru no Go that day, unfortunately, but I was walking around just perusing the wares that they had available, and one thing they have is just this like hanging display of cellophane-wrapped Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance games, just all Japanese. So basically, I couldn't recognize what any of them were because the covers, they all had Japanese on them. But looking at these, you know, Game Boy games, I, I thought, you know, it'd be really cool if I found a Hikaru no Go game here because there was a Hikaru no Go Game Boy Advance game. And I was like, they possibly might have it here because it was never released in English, I don't think. And so I immediately Googled the game to see what the cartridge looked like. And to my surprise, I found that there were two versions. There was like a first Hikaru no Go game, and then there was a second game, a sequel, which surprised me because I didn't think that the first game would be popular enough that they would make a sequel to it. But um, I looked at the game cartridge, cartridge designs and they both featured a grid in the background of some text. So I was like, okay, got it. I'm going to look for this cartridge. And it didn't take much time. I found the first Hikaru no Go game hanging there right in front of me for $3. So uh, I picked it up. It's, uh, I have it in my hand right now. I'm looking at it. Um, it's pretty cool to have just as a collector's item. Um, I want to play it, but unfortunately I don't have a Game Boy Advance, nor do I have a Game Boy Advance SP, but what I do have is a Nintendo DS, the original Nintendo DS, the DS Fat as we used to call it. And the DS Fat on the underside actually has a Game Boy Advance cartridge slot, so you can play Game Boy Advance games on it, but this DS I've had for like... I don't know how long. This, I got it basically when the DS came out. And it's really old. The hinge is busted. And I haven't used it in ages. And I don't have a charger for it. So I ordered a charger online. I'm going to see if this thing works. If not, I'm going to see how I can get it to work. And possibly play some Hikaru no Go. Which would be awesome. I'll probably take my phone and use Google Lens or something to translate all the Japanese that comes up on the screen. But I really hope, fingers crossed, I can play this game. Welcome to Start Point, the show about Go for Go fans away from the board. And today's topic of discussion was suggested by a listener from the listener mail last week, G DJ74033, uh, kindly suggested a topic about how to take notes for Go. For when you're studying Go, how to keep track of your uh, progress and take notes of what you've learned. Uh, I thought that was an interesting topic to cover. So thank you for the suggestion, DJ. Um, and I want to get right into what I've learned works best for me. And maybe it can kind of spur some discussion about how to take notes for Go. Because I think there is an important aspect of taking notes, um, which is that it it is a good record of what you've learned because without taking certain kind of any kind of record of what you've learned, you 
can often feel like you're progressing when you're just kind of running in the same spot for months. If you learn something new in a game of Go and you you kind of just have this light bulb moment and you say, aha, I learned something. And then a month later, if you're asked the same question, you face the same problem and you're still not able to solve it, have you actually learned it? Maybe you've failed to learn it completely and every time you face the problem, you learn a little bit more of it, but maybe that's a little too slow. Maybe we need to test ourselves more often on certain points that we think we've learned and use that to make sure the knowledge that we attain is really fully absorbed. And that's kind of the idea behind why I personally take notes. And I'm going to go break down everything I kind of do to do that, starting with SGF organization. I have folders upon folders of SGF files. I highly recommend you take uh, SGF copy of all the games that you play on all the different servers, especially if you play on more than one server. Now, if you play on just OGS and you just like looking at the SGFs on OGS, that's fine too. But for me, I play on Fox, I play on OGS. I have some games going back into my KGS era and I need to have them all in one place so I can go through them. And I also don't want to necessarily open up um, a certain, you know, like Fox to like access my Fox files and things like that. I want to have it all in one place. And I have folders organized by year and by month. So I have like 2021, 2022, three, four. And then within each year, I have all the months. And I just throw the SGF every month. I just kind of throw the SGFs of that month into the appropriate folder. Uh, one exception would be correspondence games. I don't know why. I just never felt the need to download and keep correspondence games. Maybe that's kind of like where I just um, leave that in OGS for, for OGS to handle. I just never I just never felt like the need to review correspondence games because it feels so not fresh in my mind when I play them. And so when I go back to like review the game, the first few moves I played like a month ago, and I'm like, I don't remember doing this. <laughs> so it's like more of like a constant, maybe I, I need a better habit of reviewing my correspondence games as they're playing out or something like that. But anyway, I just, you don't have to do it the way I'm doing it, where I organize by folder and by month, but I highly recommend you find whatever works for you when you organize your SGF files. Because it's not just those files, those game files that I have. I'll get more more into it in a bit, but I do also have like another file, another folder called KGS Archive, which has just all of my, you know, past disorganized games dating all the way back to whew, 2008. These are games that I played with my buddy when he was trying to introduce me to the game and I was not having it. And I never, I didn't play for a while after that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just good to have an archive of it. I should probably back these up. <laughs> but um, yeah, step one, get your uh, files organized. It'll definitely help navigate your history and look through what you've learned whenever you need to. After you have, well, I guess it's the same time, but once you decide on a way to organize your files, you're going to want an SGF editor. So explore different editors so that you know what you're comfortable with. I personally use one called Sabaki. I really like the clean design of that one. Um, I know some people may not like the vertical branching because uh, Sabaki, instead of going left to right for the branches, it goes top to down, which I'm totally fine with. But um, another good SGF editor would be Go Right. Uh, another very popular one is the KGS Sigoban, which is just the, um, well, Sigoban, I, I believe stands for Computer Goban. And that one is just a classic one that has all these amazing shortcuts built into it. Uh, it's just not, I don't think it's as light for me. I feel like I have to open up the KGS client. I got to log in and stuff. I think, I, I don't remember there being like a standalone where I could just open up the app. But I like Sabaki for that because, you know, you don't, you just got to open it up. It's very lightweight. 
and it has various notation tools and it's very versatile. Um, Go, Go Right is also amazing. One thing that Go Right has over the others is that you can move stones. Um, like you can click and drag stones from one area to another, like like you're actually moving the stone physically, which you can't do with pretty much any other SGF editor. But unfortunately from that kind of, there's a drawback to it, which it creates these broken branches. Um, but if you know how to use it, it's, it's a very powerful tool. They even have, I go over this in the uh, Go Technology episode, I think that was episode 15, but they even have this like search function where you can search for different shapes. If you p- put all your SGFs in one folder and then have Go Right analyze them, you can search the files by shape it's it's a little complicated to use so i don't actually use it much but if you're into that and you can kind of tech savvy your way into uh making that useful for you i'd highly recommend doing that and if you don't like any of that uh you can always just upload your games to ogs and keep your games on ogs I, i'm sure that's totally fine and if you like the ogs interface and you like the, to review games on ogs You can do that or whatever SGF editor you find, just find one that you're comfortable with, that you can take notes with, that um, serves what you're trying to do. Okay, Um, so that's kind of like the meta stuff. And now we'll get into the actual note-taking aspect of this. And we're gonna start with game review and we're not gonna end with game review, but game review is kind of the foundation of taking notes. And a lot of people, they'll flip through a game and they'll just kind of review it in their heads. Oh yeah, this is good, this is bad, blah, blah, blah. And just kind of like do that. I really think it's very useful and valuable to go through a game while actually writing stuff down, plotting out variations and saving that as a completed piece of work. I think, I don't know, I never, (laughs) I was never one to take notes in school. I just kind of tried to pay attention and absorb everything and then cram study, and it worked out for me. But for Go, I don't know. I guess there's just so many specific things you need to learn, and I found it actually to become very enjoyable to start writing these manuscripts of SGF files and write down all sorts of things during a review. But one thing that you have to avoid is getting so caught up in the review that you take hours to to do the notes and then next time you want to do the review you don't want to do it again because you know how long it took last time so keep it lightweight don't put so much on your plate go through the whole game and then this you can find in my like uh ai or how to review your games episode forget which number that was but just in a nutshell just go through your game uh, after you play it and find the number one two and three reasons you won or lost and try to pinpoint those places and also go through just kind of asking yourself questions, noting important details, try to put yourself back in your shoes for when you were actually playing uh, the game and write anything interesting down, like how you were feeling about a certain move. This was unsure. I knew this was a bad move, but I played it because I was scared, something like that, right? You can, all those things I think are valuable to write down. Um, And then there are also things you can figure out, right? There's some things that you at some point knew, oh, I don't know what the best move is here and I don't have enough time to figure it out. So I'm going to play this move. Try to remember those moments, go back to them in the SGF and think through and see if you can actually find the right answer and try to find the definitively better moves that you can come up with on your own and write those down. And this is gonna be very helpful once you write down all your thoughts, once you go and decide to review with AI if you so choose or with a teacher. If you go with an AI, you can go to those specific moves that you were not sure about and ask the AI, hey, what's the... um, best move here and then you can add another note to that and add a variation of some sort and say this is what the ai suggests and this is what i think about it so um again you can check out more of this stuff in the how do you review your games episode but go through your game and just write down what you find to be interesting what you find to be better or worse 
Um, and anything that you learn through the process, make sure you write down the variation on the SGF. Okay, now that you're done the basic steps of just reviewing your game in your SGF and you have your game reviews organized, this is where the kind of fun part comes in with problem extraction. So I noticed with teachers, uh, a couple of the teachers that I've had in the past, what they do is they take your game and they will create problems out of certain moments from your games. They'll take an interesting moment, they'll pull that moment out and say, hey, what do you think about this move right here? And just focusing in on that kind of helps you place yourself back in the game. Once you have like a review of this like 200 move game and you're trying to get through it, you really kind of blur through it. But if you're able to identify these focus points and extract them and create problems out of them, it helps you really drive home certain concepts that you're trying to learn throughout the game. And so because of that, I started doing my own problem extraction. And so when I go through a game review with myself and I find definitive answers, there are a lot of moments where I don't know the real answer. There's like, oh, I played here and I don't know what else I could have played. And I still don't know. Even after reviewing with AI, I still don't really get it. I'm just going to leave that alone. Maybe I'll, I'll save that question for, for asking a strong player. But if I find a certain move and I played, I don't know why I attached here. The kick here is clearly better. And I know because this, this, and that, right? And, and you want to focus on that kind of uh, point for improvement. That's when you can frame that SGF and pull it out as a problem file. Now, so this is what I do. So once I get to a point where I feel like there's a problem that I can create, where I know a uh, right and wrong answer, that's very important. You don't want to create vague problems where you're not fully sure, when you don't fully understand the answer to the problem, where if you showed it to someone else, they might disagree with you, then that's probably not a good problem because it shows that you're not really learning anything. You're, you're still kind of figuring it out. And But if there are moments where you for sure know, like I should have done this when I did this, right? When you've kind of decided, like this is something I do want to learn and I do want to start practicing. That's when what I do is I, I'll take the SGF that I'm working on and I'll, I can do this in Sabaki. I don't know how well you can do this in the other SGF editors, but for, for Sabaki, I am able to copy that branch or that state and uh, I, f I think f flatten, I forget what the term is, but basically it cuts off the entire beginning portion of that file up until that point. So let's say on move 37, there is a problem that I want to learn. Then it'll cut away all the excess all the way up to move 36. And when you open the SGF file, it'll start on move 37. So that's what I do. I copy that set of moves over into a new fresh file. Obviously, I'm keeping the original game review file intact, but I copy that file over, and I, for the first move, I write the problem prompt, and that can be anything from black to play, or it can be a multiple choice question, like, and then I put in the SGF A, B, C, D, and there's some some answers. And one of them is what I played in game. One of them is what I figured out to be the right answer. And then the other two, maybe other considerations that I, I figured out, but weren't the right answer possibly. Um, so I take that, uh, just that moment out. And I also note this obviously in my review too, I actually start off that way. I basically just note in my review, hey, uh, here's a problem, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll copy that file out into a separate one. And for that month, I have a folder called study. And so let's say we're in October now. So it'll be like 2024 folder. Inside the 2024 folder, there'll be an October folder. Inside the October folder, I'll have all my games and then I'll have some that I've reviewed. And then I'll have another folder called study. And that's where I put all my problems for that month. I have been doing it recently, but uh, that's what I have been doing when I have been doing it. But uh, I'll, I'll save that problem from that game, and it'll be, again, 
some kind of prompt on the initial move, like how should white attack? Um, and the way you frame your problem, it really depends on what you're trying to focus on. If you really want to focus on finding the best move and you don't want any hints, then you just have to do something generic like white to play, black to play. If you want to focus on a certain technique and you don't want, like, let's say, um, let's say the problem is like you attacked one way when you should have attacked in another way and you want to be able to learn which way you should attack. But remember, when you go back to this problem, you won't have it fresh in your mind. So if you say just black to play, I mean, ideally you will remember, oh yeah, this is when I should attack and I should attack this way. But that's not always the case. And sometimes it's better to just kind of focus in and hone in really on the root of the problem and not have you think so hard about other things. So let's try to explain this a little more. When you write, how should white attack? You are no longer thinking about like, oh, where's the big move? Where are the strong and weak groups? Like, is this a is there like a, you know, kind of Tsuji in the corner here? All that stuff you normally think about during the game, like, because you're just being plopped right into this middle of the game, in the middle of this game, without any contact. So when you say, how should white attack? It gives you a big hint as to what you should be focusing on thinking about. And that can be a good way to focus on what you're supposed to be learning with that problem. Um, rather than making it so open-ended and having you like struggle and finding some Tsuji in the corner that is irrelevant to what you were trying to learn. And then when you go check the answer, you realize, oh shoot, that's not even what I'm supposed to be looking at. Um, just my two cents on that. I think it is good to focus in on what you're learning. Um, and then once you extract that SGF with the problem out, I name it something that kind of characterizes the problem without giving away the answer. Some examples I have, there's a file I have called Atari or not. I assume that's some kind of problem where I decide whether I need to Atari or not. Uh, Mi approach, three, four, escape. I have no idea what these problems are. Uh, they were from a couple months ago and I don't know what they include, but um, from that I can kind of I don't know. It's just a way to name the file. You can just say A, B, C, or D like as your problem file. It doesn't really matter what you do or what your system is as long as you're keeping them organized in some way. Um, I, I find it very helpful to have them in separate months throughout the year so that I can go back and see what I've been struggling with over time. And if I go back two years and I look at a problem and I still haven't learned it, that tells me something different from when I look back one month and I, and I haven't learned that problem yet. So. Um, I mean, I personally need to be reviewing my problems more. I don't get around to it very often, but um, I'm very glad that I have them. And uh, I, it's thanks to my teachers because that's kind of the way I felt was very effective in learning when they sent me a problem created out of my games. So that's what I started doing that. Um, and uh, this note-taking strategy is actually quite enjoyable once you get into it. and. Uh, see the beauty in SGF note-taking. Uh, I really enjoy it, and I actually have extended it to YouTube videos as well. So when I look at YouTube lessons, I will sometimes write out the entire lesson in an SGF form, uh, whether it's a Joseki lecture or a Tsuji lecture, or if I see some moment in a game review that I find very interesting, I might copy that par part of the board down and create a problem for myself from that YouTube video. And I also have like folders dedicated to particular YouTubers. And uh, let me just look through my uh, files here. I have uh, I have also a pro game, you know, a program folder for SGFs. Let's see, study, Go Magic. I have Paduk Doctor. I have Hanayo. I have uh, my old teacher Kaz. Go Inside, Go Pro Yanu. And then there's in each of these there there may be one, maybe four or five. Who knows? Um, lectures in a SGF format. And it's just, I guess, two parts. Like one, you can kind of go through it without having to watch the entire video. Uh, another though is I think creating these files really helps um, perform an action to concrete, you know, concretely encode something into your memory. So I don't know. I enjoy it. It's something that I really like doing and I think it is helpful for me. I hope that's helpful for you. Um, but one other thing I want to mention before we take a break, 
the other strategy that I have that is not an SGF file form. Uh, I actually dropped it on the floor. <sighs> sticky notes. I have a whole bunch of sticky notes that I used to use. I don't, I haven't been doing this these days, but uh, my attack and defense book, I've just stored these in the inside cover of my attack and defense book. And what I used to do was just, and I've seen Z Chen do this, Michael Chen, the uh, AGA pro. Um, not with sticky notes, but when he streams, I've noticed he puts like little notes on the side. So he, he reminds himself on what, what to work on. And I think that's a really good way of working on some of your problems and things that you were trying to focus on during your games. Uh, I mean, obviously for online games, right? Because same for, I mean, all of this stuff, unless you're diligently taking SGF notes of your live games, a lot of this is just mostly applying to online stuff. But um, what I wanted to do was when I encountered, I lost a game a certain way and I lost a game that same way again, I wanted to make sure I had that, that um, problem in mind when I played my next game. And so what I would do is I would just write down a very important point on a sticky note and just stick it near my computer screen so that I am always looking at it, always aware of it, thinking about it. Even when I'm not playing Go, it would still be there. And so I would think about it more every now and then. So being having that physical presence of the thought that you're trying to rec record into your brain, I think over an extended period of time helps a lot. And I wanted to just, kind of sh just share with you some of these sticky notes that I have. It's like a, it's like a pretty, you know, it's a you know medium sized stack. Um, and I don't, I don't know what all these say, but I have one that says attack number one, seal off number two, reduce eye space. And then defense number one, don't get sealed. Number two, make eyes. I think this is like a super condensed version of the classy approach that I wrote down for myself. And then I have another one that says respect each move with respect underlined. And then under that, it says, use your time in all caps and highlighted. Uh, using those kind of visual things really helps as well. I put a, I actually drew a clock next to it. I don't know if that was necessary, but um, apparently I wrote this down when I wasn't using my time. I was kind of just playing my move as soon as it was uh, my turn. I have another one that says, weak groups equals infinity points. Surround and win. Be confident. Play big around weak. I think I think uh, that first part was from the Dwyerin lecture. Weak groups equals infinity points. <laughs> um, confidence. You know, confidence is an issue that you face sometimes during the game. Like being confident can help. Uh, how to use influence. Play away. Read. Read in all caps highlighted. Surround and separate. That was all that was all for that note. Surround and separate. And then I have another one. This one, I don't know if this is really a sticky note type thing that you should do, but it's like I drew a shape out and how to cut that how that shape is cut when there are stones in certain areas. I don't think this was super helpful, but maybe just as a note taking, it was helpful for me to encode. But it's like a bamboo joint. I called it a bamboo joint plus tiger's mouth, but the, the shape is like, imagine a bamboo joint, you know, the two stones on one side and then, and then skip, like basically uh, two one space jumps next to each other. And uh, this shape is a slight variation of that where one stone is farther away. So it looks like, like a trapezoid, I guess, kind of. Anyway, that shape's cuttable if you have stones in certain areas. Uh, and then I have one that says, number one, steel base. Number two, surround. Number three, reduce eye space. This is a attacking steps, I think, again. Ooh, this one is like, uh, this one says sparring. Use your time. Chill. Watch your groups. <laughs> I don't know what sparring means. Oh, sparring means uh, just keep playing your games like you're sparring. Like you're just kind of getting your, your reps in. Got this one. Consider the knight's move. Take the outside. Don't Atari if you have to fix. Careful in the end game. 
Joseki thinking in the middle middle game. That one requires a bit of explanation. Joseki thinking in the middle game. I actually don't like a lot of these. I don't remember what I meant by them. <laughs> it's funny, but I think what I'm saying is like in the opening you have this intuitive Joseki thinking that you do where you you kind of think about what's the strongest move is it to push is it to hane is it to extend is it to approach from the other side and i'm saying to kind of use that problem solving logic and intuition as you enter the middle game as well i think uh and then i have one that's like a drawing of weak and strong that i would need more time to decode and then this last one i have it says Try territory, which means like, you know, I always play an influence game and I'm just reminding myself, try try more of a territorial game. See see what happens. I again have chill. <laughs> and then I have where's your profit? Induce. If you don't know, inducing, I still don't really know how to do this, but basically inducing is like you make your opponent play a move that makes you play a move that benefits you like you need to fix your shape so instead of just fixing your shape you attack your opponent who then in return attacks you which prompts you to fix your shape so in the end of the day you fixed your shape i think <laughs> i'm not very good at that so i don't really know how to explain it either but those are those are like a pile of sticky notes that i use um especially when you're kind of playing regularly i think these are helpful just to have around i i liked to rotate them out and just kind of add new ones all the time to see um if i can work on different things but those are my note-taking strategies uh and i hope they helped for you my note-taking habits are not purely for study and improvement although they're i would say at least 90 percent for that I also just take notes because I think SGF files are quite beautiful just as records of games. And it's like a modern version of the way that ancient masters used to take paper notes, uh, the Kifu record of a game. And I think those are also incredibly beautiful, although much harder to follow. If you've ever tried to follow a um kifu you know just like on a paper and you play out the game you gotta look for the move and it's if you're not as good at following what the pros are thinking like it takes a while to do um but because i just think i love you know i love recorded games just the fact that these games that happen are recorded move for move exactly the way they happen i think those are beautiful so in fact, whenever I have a game where I find it particularly noteworthy, something I want to remember, I actually record it into a notebook, a Kifu notebook. So I write down number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the moves into a grid using a red and black pen. The red pen being a, a representation of the white stones and the black one for the black stones. And my fiance actually got me these awesome pens that have these erasers on them. And they're like way better than uh, what I, I've previously experienced with pen erasers. They just smudge and rip the paper. But these ones, they I don't know, they use some kind of special ink. And uh, they erase quite well. Because when you start taking pen notes on a Go board for hundreds of moves, you're bound to make a mistake. And I hate, hate, hate scribbling out or whiting out the number. Um, so those are very helpful, but, uh, I really like taking notes, not only for the learning benefits, but, but for also the, just the beauty of the stones on this file or paper, whatever format that you choose. And it's time for the DDK advice corner. And the tip of the day is a tip from last week. I want to emphasize because I really liked this tip from Shrey Ash Banderi, who is a three Don Fox player. He says the one tip that he would give people is to play away from strength. And I've been thinking about this as I've been playing my moves. And it's really helped frame what I should be doing during a game. And I really liked this concept. Basically, when you have a board 
try to evaluate the strength and weakness of all the groups on the board. And once you evaluate that and you see certain things are strong and certain things are weak, don't play near the strong ones. There's less value in it for you. There's less value in it for your opponent. Play somewhere else. That's, I think, a good general tip to follow. And it's been helping me like when I am stuck and I don't know what to play and I'm tempted to think about some kind of thing to play near strength and I remember this tip and I evaluate the board, I think, oh yeah, you know what? Why would I be playing in this area when this pl- this place is so strong already? Let me go play somewhere else in Tanuki. So I think that's a great tip. Thanks again, Shrey Ashbandari, for the tip. Um, play away from strength. And now it's time for listener mail. Paul S. writes, Hi, this is my response to the question, what was your first live tournament like? My first and only so far live tournament experience was in 2023 with the Peruvian Go slash Shogi Association in Lima, Peru. That is so awesome. You guys have a Go slash Shogi Association. Um, And I always say my listeners in Europe and North America, and I I always neglect that there's other places in the world. I'm so sorry. Uh, In South America, in Africa... Uh, in Asia, I'm sure. I mean, maybe not as popular, but um, because they've got their own Go content going over there. But uh, it's really surprising whenever I hear about like all these p- different places, um, or listeners from all these different places write in. Um, I-, I entered as a 13K, and my first game was with a Fordon. It felt like my groups were in grave danger the entire time. Needless to say, it did not go well for me. This opponent ended up winning second place overall in the tournament. My goodness, why would they pair a 13Q with a Fordon? You may have a small player pool or something really bad happened with the pairings, but that's a that's a stark difference, 13Q and Fordon. I can't imagine it went well for you at all. Uh, my second game was with a 4Q, and again, it wasn't close. My third game was with a 15Q, and I was thinking to myself, okay, this should be winnable. I had a small lead going into the end game, but ended up playing a self Atari. Oh no, just like me! Luckily, the damage wasn't too severe, and I was still able to hang on to the win. Hang on and win. Oh, okay, not just like me. I I lost, so uh, I'm glad you won at least. My final game was with a three Don. You guys have so many strong players. <laughs> I didn't ask for it, but he turned it into a quasi teaching game. He showed me how to how co fights work, and he would occasionally make mistakes. Wink, wink although I wasn't really able to capitalize on any of them. That's very good. Like on a, if you're, if you're a three Don player and you're playing a 13 Q, even if it's a tournament game, it's like, there's no way the 13 Q is going to win. So it's very nice to turn that into a teaching game. So that's a very nice gesture by the three Don there. All in all, it was a good experience. Although I would have liked to play against more people around my level. I was there to learn rather than win. Prior to this, most of my experience was correspondence games on OGS. This year, I'm, ent- I'm entering as a 9Q. Thanks, Paul S. Thanks for writing in, Paul, and I wish you luck in uh, your next tournament. Hopefully, you find some players closer to your level instead of playing high don players. That's crazy. That would not be a good experience. I mean, I don't know. I guess like it depends on how you take it, right? Like it's it's awesome to be able to play super strong players and see how they play, but. Yeah, uh, <laughs> hopefully they can match you up with uh, people closer to your rank. Thanks again for writing, Paul. Cantor Set writes, I played my first tournament this April in Syracuse, New York. I had a blast. I registered as 5Q as that was my OGS at rank at the time. Uh, thanks for writing in Cantor Set. I, um, I think that OGS ranks are pretty, pretty in tandem with AGA ranks nowadays. So, um, like, I feel like... I mean, I did last time. I, uh, I registered as a 3Q when I was a 4Q. And I did pretty well, although I did end up ranking up after. So I don't know. I guess it's really always really hard to tell. But honestly, I think if you're going to be in a tournament, your AGA rank, or sorry, your uh, OGS rank, usually a good place to start uh, if, if they ask you what rank you think you are to uh, start up the pairings in the tournament. Uh, continuing on, most memorable was my first game. It was an even game and I was matched with a fairly aggressive opponent where we played out a large fight early on, resulting me in me killing a large group. He left that, we played on, and settled the rest of the board. I decided to play a monkey jump, then suddenly, 
My monkey jump allowed him to play a move that created me eye points to save his giant dead crew. Group. <laughs> dead croup. Sad, sad face. Which caused me to lose the game. I still think about it. Always read. Yeah, yeah. As you, you know, you've listened to my episode on my first tournament. I'm sure you know how that feels. Or I'm sure you know that I know how that feels. It's, um, yeah. I mean, this, ga this game can be very surprising sometimes. You never know what can happen to revive a group, kill a group. It's just, till the end, it's just very, it can be very stressful if you're on the receiving end of it. And then Cancer Sets provided a uh, DDK Vice Corner suggestion, and I think I'm going to read that next week. So thank you for the suggestion. Thanks for writing in, Cancer Set. I'm glad you had a blast at your tournament, at least, even though you had that uh, very uh, harsh lesson to learn. So uh, thanks for writing, and best of luck to you on your next tournament. Sadaharu writes, Having started learning Go in an era when online player was not so prevalent, it's nice to hear stories from people who have been playing Go on the internet all their lives play their first OTB tournament, smiley face. Well, thanks. I, 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 I'm glad you enjoyed it, Sadaharu. Um, I, uh, I definitely got, or what do you call it, What's cut my teeth on, uh, on the online games. So that's definitely where I felt like was my domain and playing playing in person for the first time was quite, quite awkward with like not knowing how to count stones and then like the old master next to us just counting for us because like we didn't know how to arrange the things. So um, I'm glad that was interesting to you. Thanks for writing in. Sadaharu again. And then uh, DJ7403 writes, really enjoy the description of your first match. I'm glad you uh, enjoyed that. And thanks for writing in again. And thanks for the idea for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. And then Crook Matthias Mc says, I had my first live tournament on May this year. At the time, I was 20Q. Before that, I only played once with a stronger player in person. So the tournament was a great experience. I had a chance to learn how the nigiri worked, how to use the clock and experience the sounds of playing live, like the sound of the stones on the board. It was a motivating experience and taught me that I like to play in person more than playing online. Thanks for the podcast and regards from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Here we go, another... Uh, Another uh, from the uh, South Americas. So thank you to my South American listeners. That's so awesome. I we're considering we're considering South America for our honeymoon. We'll see. But thanks uh, thanks for writing in. Um, I'm glad you got to experience live go because uh, it's it's so nice. It's so nice to actually be face to face with someone and then use the stones and put them down. It's just you can't you can't like beat it and. Uh, another thing I want to note, I've never had a tournament where we did nigiri. I've always wanted to do nigiri. It feels like so professional and cool, but like they always decide for us who's playing who. And it's, and it's like, <laughs> anyway, thanks for writing in. Nine Dark Cat writes, I go to my first tournament in late October. Super nervous. Hey, don't be nervous. It's going to be fine. Just take it casually. Don't take it too seriously. I think as your first tournament, you're just kind of getting introduced and um, don't get too nervous. Just, you know, just have fun. I think that's, that's uh, you know, what you should focus on. But best of luck to you. Hope you do well. Um, thanks for writing in. And finally, Deep Emulsion writes, I haven't had a chance to go to a tournament yet. Been really wanting to, but sadly, any of the ones I've seen are out of state. I've been trying to get information on how to set one up in, Las, in the Las Vegas area, so hopefully I can make that happen. Thanks for writing in Deep Emulsion. Um, it's really sad, yeah, when there's not enough tournaments around in an area, but that is definitely a call for you to, to try to make it happen. There probably are people like you around the area who want a tournament as well. Some people also travel at great lengths. The LA Open that we that I participated in a while back, people were driving from you know multiple hours away to get to the tournament so i mean people are passionate about go you never know who will show up so thanks for writing in and thanks thanks to all of you for writing in and honestly thanks for everyone who writes in regularly everyone who's written in at all and uh, you've really helped build this listener mail section it's really great and seeing all your comments and emails and things like that it's, it's really fun it's Definitely one of my favorite parts of recording these episodes. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to you all. Thank you for writing in for listener mail. And the question of the week this week is, how do you take study notes? 
What do you do differently that I do? Do you even take study notes? Um, I want to know your methods, what you found to work for you and what uh, you found valuable and effective for you. So if you want to share those thoughts on this question or if you have any kind of go story to share or have a question you want to ask me, you can comment on YouTube or the Reddit post for this episode or you can email me directly at startpointpaduk at gmail.com. That's startpointpaduk at gmail.com. If you're a YouTube listener, I would greatly appreciate a like and a subscribe. And if you're a podcast listener, reviews and ratings also help. A very, very, very special thank you to Jeffrey H., James B., and John M. for supporting Starpoint. And you know what? Oddly enough, ghost stones don't move. Thanks for listening, everyone. Keep playing Go. Thank you.